All right, we're recording now. And this is number 2022. Let's see. That's okay. I don't have the number. You're the even numbers, and I think last one was 21. I started noting it on my my notes here. Yeah, last one was 21. This is 22. All righty. Hmm. Sure. Uh, I touched on a lot of stuff this week. I'll see if I can hit the high notes here. Um, let's see. So got to scroll up on my notes here. Uh, I mentioned to you offline, Jasper, I had another strategic coach session. Uh, so I signed up for that entrepreneurial training program. Uh, strategic coach is a program from Dan Sullivan, who wrote Who Not How and 10X is 10X is easier than 2X, and he wrote uh, The Gap and the Gain, which are all great books I recommend. But um, yeah. so I did a session that was about who, not how. It was a, a Zoom session uh, leading up to the workshop that I'll be doing in February. But uh, I'll just do a couple of takeaways here. A lot of the stuff uh, is about unique ability and finding your unique ability or abilities and staying in the sweet spot of doing those things and then letting other people who enjoy doing the things you don't enjoy doing do, do those things. So a couple of quotes that came out of the workshop that I wrote down were um, the, no friction, no drag, no bother. <laughs> like setting up a life where you have no friction, no drag, no bother. Uh, yeah. Work life. Yeah. Right? That's a, just a good one-liner. Uh, another one for finding your unique ability or thinking about what your sweet spot is and where you should be spending most of your time is this is kind of a brain twister, but what can you not not do? Like, what's the thing that you just really have to do that makes you feel good that, you know, you feel like crazy if somebody else on your team was doing it. So, um, and then another quote, another one liner is delegate everything but genius. So whatever your genius is, whatever you're really good at, whatever you lose track of time when you're doing it, or people around you tell you that you're good at, um, that's what you keep and you keep doing and you delegate everything else. Uh, so those are some just one liners I wrote down. And then, you know, the, the unique ability thing I've been drilling down on, there's some, a lot of videos from strategic coach on YouTube. They have a channel there. So I've been, one of the things I want to do is get really clear on, I have a strong idea of what I should be doing and what my unique ability is, but I'm trying to drill down on it more. And one of the exercises that Dan Sullivan recommends is that to find five things, in your business that you're doing that you don't enjoy and then outsource them this quarter and then find five things that you love doing that you want to do more of and then fill in that space with those things and if you do yeah. three quarter then you're outsourcing 20 things a year and adding in 20 things that are enjoyable for you mm -hmm. or having 20 times more of your enjoyable activities so that's a, yeah. a concept i like um, and then, yeah, inspiration. I, I met a lot of my fellow entrepreneurs who were in the program. And it was cool to see what everybody is doing, you know, entrepreneurs from all over the country, the different types of businesses people have and how a lot of the things that entrepreneurs face in business are the same no matter what your business is. And and uh, just fun to, to to meet more people growing their businesses and wanting to live, uh, you know, live a bigger life. And that's I guess that's the other that's the other quote is. Uh, Dan Sullivan says that I like that I've been sort of touching on this week is always make your future bigger than your past. I like that sentiment mm -hmm. thinking in that way. Um, so yeah, other than that, I've watched a little Alex Hormozzi, which I do almost every week, both Jasper and I like him a lot. Um, I don't have any big takeaways from that presentation uh, that I was talking about offline Jasper, but he did a, uh, 
video with where he did a presentation to a lot of real estate agents and it was really good. I just am only like 10 minutes into it. So I can't really give any strong takeaways on it, but I uh, always enjoy watching him talk about business and prosperity and uh, quality of life and how to break it down really simply. He's, he breaks things down into bite-sized pieces in a good way. Um, and he's very credible because he's a guy who's done uh, really big numbers in business and seems really happy in his relationship and healthy and engaged in life. So uh, I recommend Alex Hormozzi if you haven't checked him out. Uh, oh, I just want to mention one other thing about Dan Sullivan and then I'll move on. But for anybody who's thinking about writing a book, and I've thought about this, he broke down on one of these videos I watched his book writing process. And um, he started off because he had like concepts that he wanted to, to share and expound on. And he didn't want to do the writing on his own. <laughs> but he liked sharing the concepts. So there's a business that somebody created out of strategic coach called 90, your 90 minute book, I think it's called. And you can go on the website and they, you pay them a fee and basically they will interview you for 90 minutes and then they will generate a book like a, a mini book and it can be a marketing tool for you or you can sell it on Amazon or however you want to do it. But, and they'll illustrate it, create cover art, they'll create the back cover. And so basically you do like a 30 minute interview with them initially where they'll you break down like, and they help you prioritize what your book is going to be about and what the, you know, the bullet points of your book are. And then you do a 60 minute with one of their interviewers who just interviews and then they transcribe that. I think they make it into an audio thing and then they, they do it as a print book. And so that's how he started. And then, then he was like, Oh wow, this is pretty easy if you do it this way. And then he got people from within his team to like polish that concept. And now he does, he has a goal to do a book a quarter for 10 years or something like that. Something crazy. And he's been doing it for years. He does a book every quarter, but it's just, he comes up with a concept and then his team is in place to help him do it. Somebody interviews him, somebody does cover art, somebody does all the pieces of it. And then a book comes out. He said it takes him, you know, like 20 or 30 hours a quarter to do the whole thing. Cause he has to think about it. He has to like outline it, get the concepts down, do the interview, all that stuff. But, uh, but so that's pretty cool to, to know that you can just pop out a book that easily if you want to, if you have something that you're a, an expert at or a specialist at and you want to gain some credibility in the market, like you can have a book that's be like, here's how I wholesale land, you know, or whatever it is. And uh, the other cool thing about it, there's one other point about it that, uh, oh shoot, I lost it now. It was, I was talking about this and the other thing went out of my head. But yeah. Uh, Oh, he was talking about the, the statistics about books. And another reason he does micro books, all of his books are like, you know, I have this one from him, which is a bigger one. It's uh, Laws of Lifetime Growth. And this is one of his larger ones. It's like 150 pages almost. But uh, Team Success Handbook, this one is uh, 78 pages, 80 pages. And what he was saying is that he started drilling down on stats and like Kindle has stats and for, for pay, books that are over like 300 pages, most people make it like 25% of the way through books on Kindle, you know? And, and so like his point is like, would you rather have people read your whole book or have a 300 page book that people read 25% of, you know? So, uh, so that's part of his strategy behind doing micro books of like, you know, 50 to hundred pages and just having a strong, strong point. And so he was like, if you have a 10 chapter book, instead of doing 10 chapters that are three or 400 pages, why not do, 10 books that are 50 pages and really drill down on each concept and make it a book, you know, that people actually read the whole thing. So it's just an interesting way of looking at it too. So that's all I got on that. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. I think it's called your 90 minute book. I, I Googled it. It comes right up. Yeah. Um, and it's, and, and it's like two grand, I think for, you know, the basic package and then they do some marketing and a website and stuff for you if you want to pay a little bit more but you know the, it's it's pretty it's a pretty cool business idea you know have a strong concept do an outline like get your thoughts in order and then reach out to these people and they'll get a book out for you <laughs> you know so yeah
didn't mention it. Yeah. Some of your hormones aren't firing properly, something like that. Um, and so I didn't know that. So that was that was even more impressive with his success today. But he's still dealing with it. Obviously, he has like medication that he takes and stuff. But um, that was I didn't something I didn't know. He found that out when he was pretty young, like ten or eleven. Uh, it's been kind of stuff like baseball and to do much else so he would just come home he'd watch youtube and then he started making videos with his friends um and the rest is history so it was, it was a cool breakdown just seeing his trajectory from from start to finish it was very cool i uh, enjoyed that one and obviously inspired by him. yeah So it's really cool to see, and he's and he's a couple of his friends have also started their own channel, and you know they're super successful um, with his help. So I think that's really cool. Uh, and then another one, I watched a, a really good video, but unfortunately I don't remember exact takeaways. I'll, I'll have to send it to you offline. But it was a guy named Dan Marshall. Yeah, he's too. I'm not sure, but I think he is. And I watched this video of him, which is called Four CEO Skills to Get to $10 Million a Year. And he breaks down, like, I think he said, like, zero to 300, there's this skill, 300 to a million is this skill, one to one to three or one to five is this skill, and then five to 10 is another skill. But um, I really like that video because it was kind of like Alex Ramosi, like, he just had a, a whiteboard up and he just broke it all down um, in writing. And it was very insightful. So I enjoyed that. Sounds um, great. And then I'm still reading Patrick David's book, uh, Choose Your Enemies Wisely. So I've been enjoying that one too. And then um, last thing is I watched this movie called Dumb Money. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't the best movie, but it was funny. And uh, that was just inspiring for me because the main character uh, was kind of like a nobody. He worked in finance, like at a bank or something. I think he was an investment advisor or something like that. And he started like a streaming channel. And basically, he would just share his stock picks. And for some reason, he got the idea to. He started building more and more of a following because um, he had like a weird name. It was like something, something kitty. And he wore a cat t shirt and like a bandana. And stuff. he did videos in his basement. Really funny. I think, I mean, this is how they depict it in the movie, but it's based on a true story. shorting GameStop because they thought the company was going to go out of business because they shared the stats and GameStop lost $630 million in the year prior. Wow. Um, like on the year, just in one year, they lost that much money. And so, you know, rightfully so, all these bigger companies were like, this company might go bankrupt. And so they were buying a lot of shorts on the stock, expecting it to crash. And so this guy somehow picked up on that and he built a cult following that was doing exactly the opposite, trying to pump up the stock and trying to basically like take the money from their shorts because they're losing money and, and, you know, make the stock go higher. And so uh, ultimately they were successful, make a long story short. And this dude went from, I think he put like 50,000 in or something initially somewhere around there and turned into 33 million bucks. And, um, and it was, it was quite a, quite a bit more story within there, but a lot of the people who followed him also got, got well, they know or near that money, but uh, some people turned like, you know, five or 10 grand into a couple hundred thousand. And a lot of people did that, you know, like just a few thousand into like 50, 100,000. Um, and so it was cool to kind of see the backstory of it. And then cool to see, you know, the main character kind of come out on top and uh, make that much money for himself, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, so it was just inspiring to see that, you know, there's always opportunity all around us. I kind of remember hearing about that story back. This was like 2020, 2021. I kind of remember hearing about it, but I totally missed all of it <laughs> because yeah. I'm not really in the top world. Yeah, uh, it was just cool to, to see that you know this random guy can make thirty three million bucks out of you know not thin air. He put a lot of work into it and stuff, but you know, but he took a big yeah. risk too. Yeah. I mean, he didn't know yeah. how it was going to turn out, but he just put, went all in. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. They uh, there was a lot of more nuances I'll share briefly, but basically they did successfully pump the stock up from like very cheap. I think most people bought in like ten or twenty bucks, and it went up to I think a few hundred, maybe three fifty was like the highest. And then um, 
some of these people tried to sell their stock and the app that most of these people were buying on was called Robinhood and they restricted it. And so a lot of people thought there was foul play in there, but basically they wouldn't let you sell or buy GameStop stock, only that one stock. And so a lot of people were like freaking out. They were like, this is illegal. They can't do this, all this stuff. And so they got hit with a lawsuit, long story. Uh, but basically nobody could sell at the top. And so the whole thing didn't work. But then after that thing happened, um, Robinhood opened back up because they were getting sued and all this stuff. And basically they pumped it up again. And then everyone sold at the second, wow. at the second peak. So really cool to see because you know, they could have easily lost everything. And it, the movie did a good job showing it. Um, and it was pretty funny too, because they had some, some funny characters in there. But anyways, that, that's pretty much it. So uh, yeah, that's it for me. I love movies like that based on a true story. Yeah, it, it was fun. It was, it was kind of like the big short, but more funny and less, uh, less serious, I guess. Mm, excuse me. But uh, yeah, that was a good one. So uh, moving on, you want to start us off with business check-in? Yeah, I'll see if I can. We spend a lot of time on inspiration. I'll see if I can go through this briefly, see what I have here. Uh, yeah, so a lot of times it starts off with KPIs when we're doing this, just what our key performance indicators are telling us. Uh, well, we, sometimes we do victories too. I'll do the KPIs. We sold two this week. Um, one of those was sold in... 13 days, which is fast for us with the land st stuff. So that was good. Um, we didn't close any again this week. So that's our second week. We're still looking for our first closed deal in January. We've got stuff in escrow. Um, we've been having some issues with some of these deals with title work and various things. Those could be in the stories part of our <laughs> podcast. I could tell stories about deals that, you know, take extra work or have nuance to them. Um, I wrote down here that Alistair checked in, he added 12 buyers this week. So I've been emphasizing that more like adding quality buyers to our buyer list. So that's great. Um, and then we got four contracts this week on land. So that's a solid showing of contracts. Uh, acquisitions is doing really great of just uh, rolling through. And uh, all those contracts came from SMS, but we do have some direct mail dropping. So hopefully we'll get some more direct mail contracts soon. Um, but yeah, those are the basic KPIs I wrote down. Uh, victories, one of those solds was, uh, it's a victory for me when we let go of people who are difficult to work with and choose to work with people who are easy to work with. So we only had one buyer for this particular property and they were being very difficult. And um, I mean, I could go into detail about how they're being difficult, but we decided to not work with them and just move on and try and find another buyer. And we ended up with two offers on the same property, you know, a few days later when we made the decision, Hey, we get to work with people we like working with who are nice to us and respectful and not, uh, you know, difficult and challenging to work with. So that was, a, that, I count that as a victory, just making the choice to say no, even though we didn't have another buyer insight or a backup offer and then um, ended up turning out great. So uh, what else? I've got this other situation that I don't know if this is a victory or not, but I figured I'd mention it. Uh, Jasper talked about us doing different types of deals and I kind of like to get into creative stuff. So I have a subject to property that I think I, it was the first deal I did when I got into real estate investing a few years ago uh, or got back into it. And uh, the buyer contacted me last week and he wants to pay the loan off early in big chunks. So, um, he owes like 140,000 on the loan. And I, I think he wants to pay like in two chunks of 70 or something like that, which is great. Cause it's, wow. yeah, I mean, that's not profit for me. That's I've got an underlying loan cause it's a sub two. It means I will realize some profit after the underlying loan is paid off. So it's kind of cool because, um, you know, I will get some cash coming in if he chooses to pay that off. He's talking about over the next few months, I'll have cash that I thought I would have, you know, I could have had, in as long as like 25 years from now, right? Yeah. Um, the, the downside of it is that, you know, it's 8% interest amortized over 30 years. So if he had paid off the loan over 30 years, my my cash out would be a lot bigger than it will yeah. be if he cashes it out now, but it's still, it's still a windfall. So interesting little thing. Uh, and then I guess another victory and just keeping on the theme of the who, not how and unique ability and working in your sweet spot is I, I have given myself some blocks of time. I've been more conscious of blocking out time for me to just work on the projects that I know 
are going to move the business forward, even if it's crunching. Sometimes I do stuff like crunch KPIs and look at trends and project out. And I feel like I'm not really working, but that's also because I enjoy doing that stuff and it's fun. It does bring value. It does grow the business. I have to remind myself of that and give myself those blocks. So I did uh, give myself some blocks of time to, to work on that and setting our, our goals and targets for the first quarter and even figuring out how I can incentivize that or gamify it for the team so that we can uh, have fun getting there together to our financial goal for the year. Uh, and I think I had a couple of challenges I put on here too. Let's see. Um, sorry, I scrolled past my, my notes. Yeah, so I mentioned the buyer on that one property. That was a challenge turned into a victory. Um, and I mentioned offline to you, Jasper, just sort of the pain of doing stuff that has drained my energy and not doing the things that give me energy. So that's what, one of the things I'm working on this year is to stay more in the working on the parts of the business or working on the business in a way that gives me energy rather than giving time and attention to things that drain my energy. So this is sort of an energetic uh energetic balance sheet that I'm working on or whatever. Uh, so I'll be working on that and probably checking in about that and working on setting some boundaries around my time and my attention and, uh, you know, reorganizing our team or hiring people so that that comes off my plate. Some of the stuff, and yeah. one of those things is transaction coordination, which does take a lot of attention and uh, there are a lot of details, but, uh, you know, it could be that working with a different attorney will help that. It could be that uh, empowering my current transaction coordination person could help that or getting help with transactions coordinations. Transaction coordination could help that mouthful. Um, and then we've got, a, yeah, just like spending time. This is an extension of that, but spending time on deals that are the lower profit deal. I don't really want to be doing that. I want to work on the higher profit higher leverage projects or deals. Uh, yeah. And the, the other challenge is this slow start to January. You know, Jasper, you and I talked about this last year, like how January has historically been our slowest month or one of our slowest months. So we're trying to do better than that this month, but we've got all these deals in escrow that have issues that might get pushed to February. So just uh, it's frustrating to have deals in December that got pushed to January that might actually get pushed to February now. And what are we going to do in January? Hopefully we can at least surpass our last January. That would feel like a victory to me. But uh, yeah. yeah. And then that just speaks to like keeping the pipeline going. You know, Jasper, you've talked in the past about cash conversion rate and being aware of how long it's going to take you from the time you do a marketing campaign until you're actually going to realize, you know, closed deals and profit and revenue coming in and being aware of that throughout the year uh, to keep your, your flow I mean, I think it feels better. It's always going to be up and down, but I think it's more comforting when your months are more consistent or not up, down, up, down, you know? So that's something that I'm working yeah. on. So yeah, I think that's all I've got. I don't, I don't really need to get into uh, complaining about the buyer situation or anything. I don't think I have any really exciting, I didn't break down any of my contracts this week or anything. But if you're listening and you want breakdowns of how we're getting contracts or more detail and, you know, we can always tell these stories more in depth. I think it's something I want to get better at when we're doing a podcast is like have a breakdown of at least one deal for people who are still new at doing deals. Like how did how did that contract come? Like, Jasper, you're good at that. But I think I want to do more of that in the future. Mm -hmm. Like at least fine. Maybe we should just make it part of the podcast is just do each of us do one deal breakdown, whether it's how we got the contract, how it closed, you know, how it sold, something, some aspect of more more granular detail about how that's all working. But I think that's that's what I got for now. Awesome. So I'll throw it over to you, Jasper. Whatever, what, what do you have for business this week? All right, let's do it. Uh, I'll start with KPIs first. So, uh, firstly, this was the biggest week I've ever had. I continue to share that lead generation has been uh, going well so far. And this week we got 229 leads just this week. And that was the biggest I've ever had by far. Um, so I'm really grateful that we hired a new lead manager this week because that was a, a lot of stuff to keep up with. Exactly. 
think it was even worse. Like it kind of went down throughout the week, but Monday and Tuesday, we got like 50 leads each on a, in a day. And I was just, we've never had that kind of volume before. Um, so I don't know what was going on there, but I guess the, the cold callers and the texting team were, were just crushing it or something, but uh, yeah. So a lot of leads coming in this week, which is, is very good for, you know, the future I've mentioned in the past, but cash conversion cycle on texting and calling is over a hundred days for me. So that's somewhere around four months that we'll start to actually realize all these leads. Um, but that, that bodes well for next quarter, you know, quarter two, that hopefully will mean we'll have a record breaking quarter two. Um, but I, I'll stay on KPIs and then I'll go into challenges. But uh, so yeah, 229 leads. Because of all those leads, we put out also a record number of offers this week. We have 82 offers, which is awesome. Um, and then in terms of hey, the bell for records, records broken. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So both of those are record for us. But in terms of uh, you know contracts and closings and everything, not so much. But we still we still got one contract this week, which is a. Uh, kind of a double victory because it's not just one contract, but it was uh, on Tuesday this week and our lead manager started on Monday and he revived this lead on Monday and then we contracted Tuesday. So huge win for him to come in Monday, already get his first contract Tuesday. And, you know, we've already got some other ones that, that we're working on because of him. So I'm really grateful for him. And it's obviously, it's also great to get a win that quickly as a new team member. Yeah. And, uh, a bonus when we get a contract so i already sent him his first bonus and like you know just morale is high so it's that's exciting for me and uh really grateful for him already he's been awesome and another great first contract within two days of working with us but also on tuesday uh without me asking or anything he um logged back in i think it was like eight o'clock eastern or whatever and made a follow-up call which i wasn't even aware of and made a follow-up call and revived another lead, which was eight o'clock. We stopped working around six. And so um, I didn't know he was doing that, but that totally exemplifies what I want in, in someone that's working with us. And that's part of our core values. That's uh, great. Like doing whatever it takes. So I was really happy with that. Um, so, so far so good for him. So I'm excited about that. Um, and then in terms of closings, we did close three this week, which feels uh, January is still looking, you know, slower, like you mentioned, but uh, last year we closed $3,750 in, in the month of January. So <laughs> You closed three I'm, deals I'm this week? Yeah, so I'm happy to say that we've surpassed last year already <laughs> in terms of the month of January, um, So, which wasn't hard to do, but I'm, I'm very excited to at least get a couple of deals under our belt already. Um, one of those deals, I don't know if I'll necessarily like count for my business because it was a rental property I was holding, and so it's like not necessarily the wholesale business, but it's yeah. still revenue coming in. Um, so the, I technically closed two deals from from wholesaling. Um, then I closed that other one, which is the rental property, which feels great. That's a victory for me to get out of that property. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to come out making a, a profit or not. We ended up making around 20K, so I'm really That's happy great. with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, after all was said and done, because I, I made a lot of mistakes on that being my first rental property and stuff, um, which I could dive into it briefly, but. recommend people don't do that uh, if i was to do it again i would make sure i buy a property vacant i would fix it up first and then i put a tenant in there i think that's a better way to go yeah um uh, and so but you know kudos on this on this property i didn't use a flat fee i used a realtor that i that i already knew in the hickory area and he was super helpful and i'm really glad i worked with him because uh he found me the contractor to do to do the majority of the work and then we went it's obviously a traditional buyer uh someone who's going to live there so they did inspections and all this stuff they came back with a small repair request, but since they were using a VA loan, it had to be done by a certain provider or whatever. And he helped me. It was totally hands off for me is my point. He helped me find that contractor. He coordinated, he paid them and I just paid it out of my settlement. Um, and so it was awesome. That's cool. uh, it, was, it was just awesome working with them. So I would recommend, you know, in these cases, sometimes if you're working with a property that might be out of your you know, area you're familiar with or something where you might need more help, you know, managing the property because I'm not local. 
uh, sometimes it is beneficial to work with an agent who has experience. And in this case, it was awesome for me. So yeah, that's great. Just shout out to shout out to him. If anyone's in the Hickory area, I'll shout him out. His name is uh, Rodney Jenkins. So if anyone is in that area, definitely reach out to him. He, he was a pleasure to work with. Um, so there's that. And then I'll do a quick I'll do a quick breakdown on the on the other closed deals. Or maybe I'll just do one. I don't want to make it too long. But uh, on this one deal, I'll do a breakdown because it was you know a few ups and downs here and there on this deal. So um, first I'll do the, the campaign and everything that it came from. So this deal was actually a cold calling deal, which is kind of rare for us. Usually they're SMS deals in, in the past few months. Uh, so this was a cold calling deal. We originally launched this campaign back in March of last year, 2023. And, uh, we got this guy came into our system. Let's see when he came in. Uh, sorry for the delay. He came into the system in September. So we launched in March. He came in as a lead in September and then we contracted in December and then we closed in January. So that's the timeline. So the campaign was launched when we closed and then approximately what's that four or five months from when we got the lead to when we closed with him. Uh, so that's the timeline there and everything. And uh, once we got the deal, this was tenant occupied and it was a bit of a different scenario than we usually would take on. And I kind of learned my lesson on this one, but basically it was in a neighborhood we've worked with in the past and we've had great success there. And so in this scenario, we were selling the property with the tenants on a lease. We typically don't do that. We typically only take tenants that are month to month because basically what that means is that there's no agreement in place. And once the buyer takes over, they can give them 30 day notice and kick them out with North Carolina state law. But with a lease, obviously you have to honor that until the end of the term. And so typically we don't take those on because most buyers don't want to take those on because typically they're, they're rented under market value, you know? And uh, in this case, that was the case. Uh, this property could probably rent for about 1100 bucks and he was only renting for 750. Um, thankfully we did find a buyer. And at first it was going to be, a, uh, I believe it was going to be 11,000, 10 or 11,000 profit at first. And so I was super happy with that. Um, this buyer was working with an agent. So there were a few challenges there. So and all that uh, good news the tenant was super easy to work with so we set that all up they did their formal inspection and then they backed out so um, that that was kind of a fail but the victory was we collected their emd deposit um you know as a state not that deposit's non-refundable unless obviously the title's not clear but in this case yeah we were ready to close we were expecting to close and they just totally backed out um, and the reason they gave, which I don't know if it was the truth, but they said that there were pit bulls on one side and their property management company didn't want to manage it because they were aggressive dogs or something. I don't know. I think it sounded like BS to me, but I was like, whatever. Um, and we collected their deposit. So uh, thankfully we made a bigger profit than we would have on this deal because when we resold the deal to another buyer, it was only a $2,500 profit. Normally I would just terminate in that case. But since we collected EMD up front, we ended up making six so it's still a small deal but you know it's better than making 2500 so yeah um and the the next buyer was one of my buddies kevin who i've been friends with since i started this business and uh funny enough that was my first deal i've ever done with him so we've jv'd a few deals but i've never sold him a deal uh, so that was kind of fun to sell him a deal and he was a pleasure to work with like you know he's my buddy but i wasn't expecting him to be that, that nice to work with <laughs> That's great. Uh, it's always fun to work with people like that. That's part of the reason why I didn't terminate the deal because he wanted to buy it. Somebody else I might have just not done it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of the long and short of that one. Um, it was it was smooth overall. So the the with the tenants, if they don't have a lease, they, you can give them thirty day notice, and that's it. Yeah. But then if they don't move out, you still have to evict them, right? Yeah, you still have to evict them. Yeah. yeah. So there's still a risk there. But in, in that sense, you know, a lot of these buyers are familiar with that and they have plans in place or processes in place to get rid of tenants quickly, you know? <laughs> yeah, because so. we have the tenant who's being difficult right now in one of ours. Yeah. But they don't have, but a, lease. Yeah, they don't have a lease, but they're not going to let us in for inspections. So that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's not foolproof. You know, but that's that's just the the rules. You know, but they don't have to get out. They never have to get out. That's a problem with tenants. They never have to leave. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was a victory and a deal breakdown on that one. 
um, for challenges slash victories. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll put this in victories. Actually, I had another deal that kind of like you mentioned, um, where it was it was a difficult deal and it wasn't really something that I was very excited about. And so we terminated that one this year. I mean, this week, and that was uh, felt like a big victory to just get that one off our plate. Um, on this one, it wasn't the buyer or the seller, but actually the tenant <laughs> that, that gave us problems. Uh, so a lot of times tenants are easy to work with. Typically, I try to get their phone number up front and then I try to build a relationship with them. So if we need to get access, we can get access and stuff. In this case, it was just totally, total fail right from the jump. He was extremely pissed off, not, not at me, but at the seller. And he didn't know that he was selling and all this stuff. And he just dug his heels in and would not let us see the property at all. And so I tried to sell it sight unseen. I wasn't successful. And at the end of the day, I was just like, I'm not going to keep uh, deal with this guy because the tenant was calling me like every day and he was like, what's going on? Like, I need to be the one buying this property, all this stuff. And, he, and I was just like, dude, just take it up with the owner. Like we don't, whatever. But long story short, we terminated that one and that felt good. <laughs> so uh, uh, I guess the lesson from today is that sometimes tenants can be great to work with. Sometimes they can't be, they're not very good to work with. Yeah. Um, but either way, in this, in this scenario as well, the one we terminated, he was also on a lease. So just as a general rule, I would recommend don't do that because it typically doesn't work out in your favor. Or if you are going to do it, um, what I'll do in the future is underwrite your deal as normal and then just take an additional 10K. That's what I'll do. Take an additional 10K off of your offer price, make that your maximum offer. And that way, if you do need to sell it sight unseen or something like that or whatever, it might be more doable. Whereas uh, in, in both these cases, it was, there were going to be slim deals anyways. And so I'm glad I terminated one of them. Um, yeah, because he wasn't easy to work with, but yeah, so yeah, that's pretty much it there. Um, yeah, the only other challenge is, is like you touched on, you know, being slower in January. I, I knew this was coming because um, in October was when I got shut down by launch control. And so that's about three or four months ago. So I knew January, February might be slower. It's still frustrating to go through it. Uh, but, you know, it's just something that they got to work through. So like, I, like I've been sharing, uh, December and this month have been really, really good in terms of lead flow. And hopefully that's going to lead to more contracts and deals, you know, from February onwards. But, uh, but yeah, this month has been a bit slow. So we're hoping to close a few more uh, before the end of the month. We'll see. I guess, I guess the last thing I'll touch on and then we can wrap up is just that other deal I mentioned to you before in New Bern. I uh, had an offer on it, a strong offer for 50000 and um, it was kind of weird dealing with this realtor. I'm still not under contract on this property, but basically I accepted his offer on Monday and I asked him to just, you know, send me the contract, whatever. And he didn't send me the contract until Friday. And so during that time, I was obviously still marketing it. And I got a bunch of offers that were super low ball that I would basically lose money on. And so I was kind of getting nervous because like <laughs> maybe this was a bad idea. And then he finally sent me the contract on Friday. Um, but his client is not willing to put up any due diligence. He will put earnest money, but not due diligence. So that was a red flag for me. And then he asked for a due diligence period until the 29th. So it's about two weeks, even though he said it's like as is, no inspections, whatever. And so basically I gave him pushback this morning. I was like, I'm not gonna do that, uh, especially not with any due diligence money. I was like, if you wanna eliminate the due diligence period, then I'll go into contract with you, but I'm not gonna wait two weeks just for you to cancel. Um, and so, you know, we'll see what happens with that. I've got another friend uh, who's working on some buyers for it too, but basically just want to ask you if you think I should roll the dice with this guy. It doesn't seem like they would close or if I should just continue marketing it. Basically his reasoning for the longer due diligence period is that his buyer is out of town. He won't be back until a week from tomorrow. And so then he needs to see the property, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I'm considering going on a contract with him because I really don't have any other good offers, but also I don't want to just waste my time. And he just cancels on me after two weeks. So, yeah, but you, you own the property, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no hurry. I mean, you're not pay, paying much to keep the property right now. Yeah, I just don't want it because it's a new burn. No, I know, but I I just wouldn't be in a hurry, you know, to to yeah. It and and it like if the guy wants to do diligence period with no due diligence money, it's a red flag, like you said, you know. Yeah. Like. So I don't know. I would, uh, my knee jerk reaction is keep it open. Keep, keep your options open. Yeah. You know? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Like put down, a, put down an EMD and we'll sign a contract or 
don't put down an EMD and roll the dice that I might find another buyer before you get by there to look at it. You know, put yeah. pressure on, on them and don't let them know that they're your only offer, you know, like, yeah. and, and don't panic because you do own the property. You know, you will find a buyer. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. That's, that's what I was leaning towards. Just telling him, like you said. Yeah. That if he doesn't want to put up money, then we'll just continue shopping until he does. <laughs> yeah, when he's ready to put down an EMD and sign a contract with an EMD that's non-refundable, you know, then yeah. if he wants a due diligence period, then he needs to put down due diligence money, right? Otherwise, you're yeah. going to keep marketing it. And But, I mean, it's. I think you're going to make money on that property. It's just, you know, a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. So that, that brings me to my last thing and then we'll wrap up. So um, I've gotten a lot of offers. They've all been extremely low to below where I even bought the property for. So that made me panic at first, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I got this strong offer and I was like, oh, that's awesome. I'll make a great profit on it if, if it goes through. But now it's very shaky. So I've got another offer that make me a couple thousand. But basically my point is I was property uh, price quite a bit to try to get some more activity on it. But his offer is at 50 and I was going to reduce it to like 40 just so I could sell it. Um, but I was, I don't want to do that <laughs> if, if he's actually going to pay 50. So yeah. I'm wondering, should I reduce it to 50? Should I reduce it at all? Um, should I just leave it? What, what would, How long have you been marketing it for? Uh, it's been up since last Friday. So about uh, nine days, eight days on the MLS. Yeah. Okay. So a fair number of eyes are probably have been on it. Yeah. Well, it could be also that you're you're used to a more bustling market, you know, in Fayetteville and Raleigh and Durham and, you know, Charlotte. And maybe it's a little bit slower there with the, the rate yeah. which people move, you know. But, yeah, I would just encourage you to be patient with it because I think you'll get a good chunk of money for it. As far as the 50K, yeah, like if you drop it to 50K, is that guy going to go, oh, you dropped 50K, now I'm offering 45. Is that what you're worried about? Yeah. 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 So maybe you should just leave it where it's at or what's it at now? Is that 60 now? Yeah. I mean, you could drop it a few thousand or you could, I mean, if yeah, I know what you're saying. Like if you drop it and he sees that it's dropped, then he's going to think maybe he's got more leverage. So yeah, you're telling you they're going to, they're going to do something by, Oh, you don't know. You're just waiting to hear back from them on your, your response to the, the request right now. Well, no, yeah, he said he's coming back in town next next week, like not this week, but next week. And so then he's uh, going to take a look at it. Um, so that's why, like, I didn't necessarily want to waste another week. Yeah, maybe you should drop it. Maybe you should drop it to 50 and, you know, see, see if you get more interest. Yeah. Yeah, because I had another person that offered me 45 and I was like, okay, like, I'll accept it. But then they hadn't seen the property and then they went by the property and they're like, oh, never mind. They just didn't even offer. I was like, yeah, oh, okay. So I figured that's what this 50K dude is going to do. He's going to go by and just reduce his offer drastically. So Yeah, well, maybe you should just drop it then. Yeah. And see if that generates more activity. Yep. All right. Well, that's going to be a good place even if you drop it to 50. You still have good profit margin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I guess that's it. I'll... Uh, Close this off with a with a couple of things from Atomic Habits from this week, and then we can wrap it up. All right. Um, so, said number one, um, new goals don't deliver new results. New lifestyles do, and mm -hmm. a lifestyle is a process, not an outcome. So, for this reason, all of your energy should go into building better habits, not chasing better results. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one. And then number two, I really like this one. He says, a simple filter for managing your time. You're not focused enough unless you're mourning some of the things that you're saying no to. I like that one. Mm. Uh, and then last one, he says, don't worry about being the most interesting person in the room. Just try to be the most interested person in the room. <laughs> in general, in general, the interested person learns more and tends to be well-liked. And in the long run, it's hard to keep someone down who is well-learned and well-liked. Those are great. That's his advice for this week. Yeah, it was a good one.
Yeah, so cool. uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. If you're watching or listening, feel free to leave a comment for uh, anything you want us to touch on in future episodes, anything you liked or didn't like about our format. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Have a great week. Yeah.